If you were a high Vietnamese general or colonel in the South Vietnamese government, army positions were like business positions. And it was most American aid was on the, it was for sale on the international market by the time it arrived. The level of theft is unbelievably high. And the only reason, it's like rather than try to control the theft, the American government essentially made the decision, look, theft by the officer corps is the price we have to pay for continuing the war. If you're a woman, the estimates are that there were like a half million Vietnamese women engaged in some kind of commercial sex. Military war managers devise ways to maximize sortie rates. It's like a factory, you keep doing the same routine. What this meant for pilots was that they died. The entire society was organized as a giant anti-aircraft anti -aircraft system. And for really low level, Vietnamese peasants were under instructions to simply get out in the fields in mass, lie down, and shoot up in the air to try to provide a barrage that would make low altitudes unsafe for American pilots. And it happened. From mid-68 on, the American military began to become progressively more restless and by certainly by late 69, 70s, an active revolt against its commanders. Uh, so people began what's called fragging. Fragging means you take a fragmentation grenade and you throw it at your superior, whether it's a non-commissioned officer sergeant or a lieutenant or a captain or whatever. It was a way to tell higher command not to treat the ground troops' lives frivolously. My analysis says the U.S. had to get out because we couldn't fight, because we had an army that wouldn't do it anymore. The second in our two-part series on the Vietnam War, featuring the author of the book, The Perfect War. We find out if the military-industrial complex has learned anything tonight on Alternative View. would come in and they'd say no more than I'm tired of fighting this war. I try to find out what the war meant to them, what it was like, including some of the guilt. And all they'd say was, I've done a lot of killing and I'm not sure it's right. Well, they'd been on sweeps of villages with orders to leave nothing living, not even chickens or water buffaloes. Well, what did that mean, following orders like that? Wasn't Lieutenant Callie and me lie, wasn't it that, that stirred up this in the first place? Hell, they were doing a me lie every day. They'd be out on a mission and call in airstrikes. Napalm would be sprayed and the people would be burning. Sometimes they'd put them out of their misery. The guys who did that are still coming into the veteran centers with this on their mind 12 years later. Welcome to Alternative Views. This is the second on our two part series about the Vietnam War with Bill Gibson, who wrote an incredible book about. Vietnam War called The Perfect War, Techno War. And his book, The Perfect War, Techno War in Vietnam, was recently published by Atlantic Monthly Press and has so far received some extremely good reviews. It was favorably reviewed in the Wall Street Journal. Kirkus Review described it as a perceptive, cogent, significant, and so far the best analysis of the meaning of America's only military defeat, highly recommended. Gloria Emerson, in a review, described the book as 
Although many valuable books on the war exist as records of pain and endurance, there is no work that achieves what this does. Because he might just save us from our most comfortable lies and sad delusions, William Gibson should be honored. And John Stockwell describes this book as, in all of my research on the subject, I have found nothing to compare with Dr. Gibson's perfect war for invaluable insights into U.S. methodology and its hideous results in the war. Tonight we're going to talk about the things we didn't cover. Um, we're going to talk about Tet, the importance of that, the Tet Offensive. We're going to talk about how the United States Army, a lot of them didn't, uh, they decided they weren't going to fight that war anymore. We're going to have an evaluation of the Vietnam War. How many, how did people look at it from various aspects? And we'll also take a final look at have we learned our lessons or are we still fighting, fighting techno war in Central America or at least planning to? What is your interpretation of techno war? How do we get involved in Vietnam? Techno war means you fight war as a production process. The military became deeply impressed with big business's contributions in World War II. After World War II, the military then decided that not only would the supply operations be organized along corporate lines, but that actual conduct of warfare would be organized along corporate lines. The officer corps were the managers, the enlisted men were the workers. The product was enemy body counts. Just as American business prided itself on high technology, capital intensive production systems, so too would our military have high technology, capital intensive warfare to outproduce we would kill more of them than they would of us. That's techno war. Why was it applied in Vietnam? Because after World War, in the 50s, the Soviets had the atomic bomb. They could then destroy our economy or the base of our power if we intervene militarily in the, war, in the world with too much force. The object then was to fight limited war for indefinitely in the third world. We would use our, we would just send our production system over there and drive the other side bankrupt. Why Vietnam? Americans saw communism not as another type of social organization, as another culture, as another political system, but instead they saw Americans as the good, the natural, the godlike, and the communism was a foreign other, an alien kind of being. The world was divided into simply two types of people, communist and non-communist, and therefore it was like debit or credit, their side or our side. By the time the Vietnamese overthrew the French in the late 50s. We had our theory of limited war intact. We had our conventional forces ready to go by the late 50s. Vietnam was simply a convenient mode, place to test out this new theory of warfare, techno war, and a place to drive the foreign other back. In fact, you pointed out something fascinating in your book about how a major part of U.S. support at a certain part of the war was to win the hearts and the minds of the Vietnamese through importing U.S. commodities to them. Yes. And the U.S. government actually put up the money to uh, import these commodities and created the whole infrastructure for it. And rather than winning the hearts and minds of the overwhelming majority of the Vietnamese people, it just created more corruption and inequality. Do you want to talk about that aspect of U.S. It's policy? It's just hard for us to realize how much money was poured into that country in so many ways. If you were a high Vietnamese general or colonel in the South Vietnamese government, army positions were like business positions. And it was most American aid was, on the, it was for sale on the international market by the time it arrived. The level of theft is unbelievably high. And the only reason, is, it's like rather than try to control the theft, the American government essentially made the decision, look, theft by the officer corps is the price we have to pay for continuing the war. So therefore, in order that something reaches the Vietnamese people, we'll just send more and more and more. And there was an element of truth in that, but it also the greater truth was that simply corruption became compounded and the, the riches became, became greater. We're talking about millions and millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars made, or even currency manipulation. Currency fraud was endemic. If you knew how to play the game, you could get rich simply by exchanging your money from, from dollars to piastres to military script and back again. You know, just nothing. Just by playing, playing with the rules a little bit. So, but it didn't. It created massive inflation. 
it meant that life for most people got worse. It, it's what were your jobs available while a few people on top were able to make money off this, this uh, stealing the American aid on the bottom? What were your jobs open for you? Well, you could work for the Americans. You could work on their base. You could be an interpreter, maybe if you had minimal language skills. These are all if you're a man. If you're a woman, the estimates are that there were like a half million Vietnamese women engaged in some kind of commercial sex. Prostitution, massage parlors, however you want to call it, hooch girls. They're, they're, it's a whole multi-levered sexual marketplace. Um, drugs is another drugs, major the drug factor. The huge, huge heroin importation coming from all places, coming from Laos. And the CIA was running a war in Laos with the Hills people and with the Laotian government. In order to buy the leaders of the Hills people and buy the Laotian government, they had to acquiesce to the heroin trade. Tons of heroin were brought in on Air America planes and, and Vietnamese Air Force planes, were refined in Bangkok and other places and sold on, in, in to U.S. soldiers in Vietnam. South Vietnamese civil and military leadership was also heavily involved in the narcotics business. General and subsequent president of the Republic of Vietnam, Nguyen Van Tu, ran one major operation, while Nguyen Cao Ki, a Times Air Marshal, Premier, and Vice President, ran another. For orphans, what could you do? Shoe shine business wasn't something kids had to make money on the side. Shining shoes was life or death issue. Uh, going through garbage dumps. You know, a very dismal life in this new urban Vietnam. Not a consumer paradise. So, so and then the other hand, you had the black market where, as you say in your book, you could buy anything. You could even buy tanks, armored personnel carriers, and of course the Viet Cong were tapping Vietnam into this. Vietnam could equip themselves whenever they needed American goods. They could equip themselves without any problem. Yeah. The other aspect of U.S. policy was air war. Part of yes. your most brilliant chapters and descriptions in your book are of the magnitude and nature of the air war in Vietnam that was mainly, I guess, directed against North Vietnam. Do you want to discuss some elements of air war? If war is a factory, then clearly when you look at, at air war, we've got the biggest factory and they have nothing. By American reasoning, the North Vietnamese should have given up the day the first bombs dropped on North Vietnam because they had such a small, small industrial apparatus, such a small number of bridges and things that you would think they would have just given up. But they didn't. Uh, they were willing to sacrifice their industrial apparatus. They were willing to absorb a massive, massive casualties. And indeed, contrary to American mythology where the Viet Cong were simply being totally supported from the North, roughly 80% of the supplies the Viet Cong used and even 80% of the supplies the NVA used were raised in the South. A small number of supplies were sent South. It couldn't be stopped. No matter how hard the U.S. bombed, no matter how much it escalated its campaigns, no matter even after they closed the ports at Haiphong and started systematically bombing the railroad lines between China and Vietnam, it couldn't stop it. The number of supplies wasn't that great. On the other hand, the air war did mobilize the North Vietnamese people to a considerable degree. Uh, everyone had a job of one kind or another, either repairing the railroads, repairing the roads, or taking over industry, or working in agriculture. So it mobilized and consolidated that society to carry on, much like the Nazi attack on Great Britain consolidated British morale in World was, War II. Awesome. But on the other hand, people used to say, well, we ought to bomb them back to the Stone Age, and we just practically did, didn't we? Most people don't recognize that the United States Air Force and Navy dropped between 8 million and 15 million tons of bombs and rockets on Southeast Asia. In all of World War II, the United States dropped 2.1 million tons. So the minimum estimate then is about four times greater than World War II, and it goes up to almost eight times greater than World War II. In, in, in Westmoreland's 1967 report, he has a target category summary. And the largest category in there after vehicles is buildings. When you listen to the reports of foreign observers on the ground, what the report is, just about any modern stone or brick structure over two, two story, over one story was hit. 
because those were the only things that looked like targets. And in essence, a lot of those were churches, a lot of them were hospitals, a lot of them were schools. Yes, North Vietnam was bombed back to the Stone Age. There's no doubt about that. But because they were not fighting a techno war, that uh, they it were still... It did cripple them. Now, we saw in the previous program where this uh, production assembly line type of attitude resulted in the demand for body count for the land troops. In the air war, they also had production quotas, did they not? And the organization of this was all right. The unit of measurement is called a sortie. That's one flight by one airplane. And Air Force squadrons, wings, Air Force, you hope know, large units have rates of production that they are supposed to meet. The Navy and the Air Force and indeed were in, com in competition with each other to see who could, quote, be the most productive. Therefore, the, to, the object was to fly as many missions as possible within a, a finite period of time, like a week or a month or whatever. So rather than, than pay attention to really what you were bombing or to pay attention to the safest way to protect your pilots and the way to minimize civilian casualties, instead, military war managers devised ways to maximize sortie rates and consequently entered into serious irrational behavior. They, like in ground war, where U.S. commander treated their own ground troops as expendable, higher command treated pilots as expendable. They would often be sent on missions on, say, looking for trucks in the middle of rainstorms when it's impossible to see trucks from five, because the ground, you know, you can't even see the ground when you're 500 feet above it. But that keeps the sortie rate high. Or also, say you're supposed to, you know it's raining over a given target and it's, the target's clouding in, but you still send your planes up there every day, five days in a row, by the exact same route, in order so that, because that's simply, it's like a factory, you keep doing the same routine. Well, we sure telegraphed our punches. There weren't all that many targets in that area, and it didn't take too many smarts to figure out about uh, where the uh, Air Force was headed especially when we headed them there day after day, making them fly up to the target before making the go or no-go decision on the weather that we already knew was not acceptable. And then we turned over the target and came back again the next day to try again. What this meant for pilots was that they died because the Vietnamese clearly understood where the Americans were, were flying the same pattern every day, and they understood that they would just keep coming. So what often frequently Vietnamese did was simply move more and more anti-aircraft guns into an area that the Americans for some reason wanted to bomb. And what ended up is American pilots ended up just fighting uh, flying missions against empty targets surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of anti-aircraft weapons. And in this way, uh, by telegraphing our, our punches, uh, American pilots died. I talked with a couple of uh, nearly apoplectic F-4 pilots at Da Nang who told me then got, they'd gone out recently on a, on a four-plane mission carrying a very small bomb load. One pilot told me he was gritting his teeth he was so mad. We risked eight guys, he said, when we could have hung the whole load on one plane risking only two people and done the job better. Well, then I ask him, well, why did they send out four planes? The pilot said, damned if I know, unless it's just to keep our sortie rate high. But I tell you this, it's a goddamn crime. Well, you know, I heard about this sortie business on uh, aircraft carrier Constellation. The Navy pilots had told me they could do a better job with a few A6s operating in the safety of darkness than with all those Skyhawks skimming around uh, with light loads in daylight. So while it didn't seem possible, it appeared that the Navy was trying to outsortee the Air Force, and the Air Force was trying to outsortee the Navy. And the guys who were flying the sorties took a dim view of it. You had an incredible story in your book or, uh, about how the North Vietnamese would actually bring down the American jets with handguns and rifles. That almost seems unbelievable to us. In, a, in an advanced, from, yeah. from an American standpoint, it is unbelievable in that you only see advanced technology system like a jet fighter bomber needs another advanced technology like a SAM missile in order to bring it down. 
And there is a lot of some amount of truth in that. But North Vietnam underwent a tremendous social mobilization. Part of that mobilization involved giving almost everyone a gun, either a pistol, a submachine gun, a rifle, or whatever, or light machine guns. The entire society was organized as a giant anti-aircraft any aircraft system. And for a really low level, Vietnamese peasants were under instructions to simply get out in the fields in mass, lie down, and shoot up in the air to try to provide a barrage that would make low altitudes unsafe for American pilots. And it happened. It American really fighter pilots do report that several, many planes were shot down at extremely low level by peasants. And what this meant to them, low level flight became so dangerous they had to move higher up where they could consistently be picked up on radar. In other words, it isn't just that peasants could shoot down planes, it's that by, they denied an airspace oh, to see. Americans that made all air operations have more hazardous. So social mobilization was able to compensate for technological inferiority. There was another example of this uh, uh, in the Ho Chi Minh Trail when the United States built that incredibly expensive electronic warfare area, which the uh, they were able, which the uh, uh, Vietnamese and the Laotians were able to overcome with very simple tricks. The Joint Chiefs of Staff always wanted to invade North Vietnam and simply take over Hanoi and Haiphong, or have ground troops in Laos. There is a place where between Laos and Thailand, between the, the South China Sea and, and Thailand is something like 35 miles and so wide. So the effort is, the, the mission was we'll, we'll just form on this magic line and we'll keep the foreign other out, right? We'll stop them at the pass, <laughs> you know, literally. But since uh, that was seen as too expensive in terms of troop lives, they seeded that area with electronic sensors, listening devices, devices that picked up smell, sensors of various kinds. Uh, these devices, in turn, sent radio signals to circling aircraft. The aircraft, in turn, sent them to, to computer banks in Thailand. In Thailand, in turn, organized airstrikes over the trail. But two things happened. One, the sensors were decoyed. Uh, bags of urine hung in trees, tape recorders with cricket noises in order to try to mask the movement of trucks. You find a sensor and you put just normal jungle noises, a tape of normal jungle noises next to it. Um, so you mask the sensors in one area while you actually send your troops and operations on the other. Or, uh, say you get attacked and uh, you were all convoy drivers, truck drivers. North Vietnamese had satchels of grenades. They had rocket flares. A lot of this is battle is occurring at night. So the Vietnamese would throw out explosives to make the Americans feel like they were hitting something. Um, and the Americans, in turn, wanted to believe that they were destroying Vietnamese truck convoys. Why? Because pilots are rewarded on the basis of productivity. They're majors and lieutenant colonels. Most of them want to be full colonels, and probably as some are desperately want to be brigadier generals. They need to be productive. Therefore, their, their tendency is to report as high a destruction of uh, trucks as possible. And that the big joke eventually became in, in intelligence was that the next day when reconnaissance flights would fly out along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they could never find the truck carcasses in anywhere near the numbers that uh, the pilots reported destroyed. So the legend began that deep in the Laotian jungles lived the great truck eater. <laughs> <laughs> and the great truck eater was a monster that totally loved dead trucks, and that it, and it lives a nocturnal beast, and that every night it got up and it Jesus. ate the skeletons of dread dead trucks, so that when the reconnaissance planes came out in the morning, there would simply be no records. This is not to say thousands of trucks were destroyed, but never to the extent necessary. Remember relatively few supplies were sent south. By American calculations, something like 12 tons a day was enough to support the war in the south. You can put 12 tons on a semi-tractor truck without any problem and have room to spare. Or even if you multiply it by figure 15 or 20 fold, say so you have 20 tractor trailer trucks a day on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, or 40 pickups or whatever. That's still such a small number that even a very extensive air war has a hard time or cannot stop 
that level of supplies. Bill, most of the military generals and participants in the war whose memoirs you read and documents you studied indicated that the U.S. really won most of the battles of the war, that the U.S. In their was, records, yes. right, was on its way to victory. And in particular, there's a right-wing revisionist view that the U.S. could have won the war at the time of the Tet Offensive. At the U.S. buildup of main corps, main force units, ground troops began in 65. By the end of 67, we had somewhat over 400,000, I think 450,000, maybe even as high as 500,000 troops in country. According to American records, the official records kept in the Pentagon and kept at Military Assistance Command Vietnam, we had just about destroyed all the Viet Cong troops. They were all nearly decimated. Now, why was that? Because our records were falsified. <laughs> right. As we began, as I talked about last time, once you move into war's production process and the officers are managers, they lose their sense of fidelity to their subordinates below and sense of their fidelity to the truth. Upward mobility, just like in business where a man would be going up, you know, up the ladder is the name of the game. That was the ladder in the military. The currency in warfare was to report the body count. So everybody upped their body count. Fake body counts were routine, not the, not the exceptional. And at each level, they were, the, the body counts kept getting higher and higher. As, as the reports went up the chain of command, the larger the figures they became. Well, the first report I would send in was from the facts, from the information we collected, and it was objective as it, as it could be. Then we sent it in, but uh, then it would always come back, doctored up from higher headquarters. That was standard operating procedure when I was brigade historian there. So the result is that the battle news was edited and revised until it was acceptable to the higher-ups. Hell, I've been ordered to write open lies on our civil aid program, such as increasing the 15 English classes to 300 to make it look good to the politicians and the people back home. And I've been ordered to raise the figures for food distribution in uh, refugee villages. But I've also had to retype battle reports omitting uh, certain facts uh, and thereby turning a North Vietnam Army victory over superior American forces into a U.S. victory. So on paper, we had won. But in reality, two things, all right, that was part one of our victory. The second point was, in 1967, the American higher command decided that Viet Cong guerrillas no longer existed because, and so they abolished them on paper. <laughs> just because just like American forces, we don't have any part-time guerrillas or full-time guerrillas. And also, do, do guerrillas have, have tanks? Do guerrillas have helicopters? Do guerrillas have um, heavy artillery? They don't have as much hardware as we do, so they aren't really a threat to American units. So several hundred thousand our Viet Cong guerrillas were abolished from what's called the order of battle. So once you eliminate the guerrillas on paper, and then you, so you have a lower total estimate of enemy forces, and you have an inflated uh, estimate of how many of those you've killed, well, we'd won. Lyndon Johnson desperately needed a political victory in the fall of 67. So he got General Westmoreland to come back and say, we're winning, we're winning, that we're soon going to enter in, into phase three, <laughs> and that is uh, we're going to mop up for a couple of years. Now, what was happening in reality? In reality, the Viet Cong forces, the native, the local forces, had expanded radically from 1964 through late 1967. According to U.S. figures, there were only about 200,000 Viet Cong. But when one CIA man started like going through the files and trying to refigure things, he calculated about a half million. And let's understand what that means. If the CIA man is doubling he the estimate, that essentially means they don't have any idea of how many of them are, are there. But it means a double is probably the highest figure he can get away with and still be listened to by anyone. So in reality, the enemy is gaining strength. We have with, through the Viet Cong. We have North Vietnamese participation still around 50,000 troops a year being sent south in the border zones along the Cambodian and Laotian borders and in certain uh, the, the I-Corps, the north of the country. Um, 
and the U.S. strategic offensive had failed of search and destroy. The bombing operations had failed. In late January, early February 1968, the North, the, the, beg your pardon, the Viet Cong forces attacked in mass simultaneously for the first time. Normally, they fought very dispersed operations. They were not under your, under, not under, no, no, this was the first time there had been a simultaneous national attack. The attack succeeded in driving, one, it ended the pacification war. All the units involved in pacification were driven out of the countryside into the cities. Almost all of the Vietnamese and American ground force units were driven out of the countryside back into the cities to defend the cities there. And some Viet Cong forces entered cities, uh, Saigon, Way, uh, regional capitals, and we began to, to battle in the cities. Now what happened? After a few weeks, the Viet Cong withdrew from the cities. Their casualties were extremely high. They had not anticipated that the Americans would bomb and, uh, and conduct artillery strikes inside the cities, uh, but they did. So a large part of South Vietnam was reduced to rubble. Their casualties were high, but the Americans and South Vietnamese urban units were gone from the countryside. Uh, desertions had been massive, and the Viet Cong were able to recruit many, many, many people. Now that there were no opposing forces in the countryside, their political cadres were able to surface. So they were weakened in many ways, but on the other hand, they had achieved a decisive victory in driving their opponents out of the countryside. Now from what is the legend then, because American forces were able to kill many of the commandos and Viet Cong troops inside the cities, the Americans of General Westmoreland declared victory. Uh, of course, this ignores the fact that although he's driven the Viet Cong out of the cities, he himself has been driven out of the countryside and they just made a mockery out of his own previous claims of victory. Um, also, it's, far cl it's clear to many, many people that there were far more enemies in South Vietnam than the Americans have been willing to admit. Westmoreland then made a troop request for another 200,000 soldiers. This troop request went under severe analysis. And essentially what was found was that if within the production model of war, if you were just going to fight the same kind of warfare but simply add more resources to it, still, the Viet Cong alone, just the people in the South, could fight on for another four or five years, or at least three years to four years, and then with any North, or with significant North Vietnamese participation, they could fight on 10 to 20 years. In which you just, we just could not drive the other side bankrupt. And you're saying that the North Vietnamese Army basically hadn't participated not all in that much? Not in Tet, not in Tet. The North Vietnamese uh -huh. Army did not participate in Tet. Okay. In fact, in most of the war, they really played a minimal role when you consider the number of Viet Cong troops in proportion to the number of North Vietnamese Well, troops. that's true up, up until 68. After 68, okay. they entered the war in larger numbers. Okay. Uh, the Viet Cong were hit. In other words, certainly the conservative claim that the Viet Cong took severe losses in the Tet Offensive is true. The claim that they were decimated and defeated is false, and the claim that the Americans won Tet is false. Tet essentially made the help the American war managers, at least the part of them, see that their strategy was bankrupt and that there was no path to victory. So this finally created a... Remember Lyndon an, Johnson yeah. resigned somewhere during this period. That's right, not too long after. Was this kind of the, uh, a break in their self-delusion that techno-war would win everything? Ah, now here is a serious problem that people do not understand. American television news began from, night, from mid, late 1968 on, began to report the idea that the war was winding down and that we were on our way out. This is not true. This is a false statement. You should never believe this. When you look at the casualty figures of how many American soldiers were killed from 65 through 68 through, 60, through 67, and then you take 68, and then you look 69 through 73, the 69 through 73 is just about, is within a couple of hundred as high as the number of killed 65 through 67. So, words, we yeah. search and destroy continued way, way on until, until, oh, late 71. So what was it then that finally convinced the U.S. foreign policy establishment or the U.S. public that Vietnam couldn't be won? From mid-68 on, 
the American military began to become progressively more restless and by certainly by late 69, 70s, in active revolt against its commanders. Remember that 75% of the battles in Vietnam were initiated by the enemy and the average American grunt spent his tour of duty, that, those few who were combat troops spent his tour of duty walking into ambushes. Um, most men learned fairly quickly that while they were walking into ambushes that their generals were getting medals and they were safe in helicopters on zone and so forth. Uh, so people began what's called fragging. Fragging means you take a fragmentation grenade and you throw it at your superior whether it's a non-commissioned officer sergeant or a lieutenant or a captain or whatever. It was a way to tell higher command not to treat the ground troops' lives frivolously, that they would not pursue, aggressively pursue dangerous combat situations that simply in order to make the, to make the superiors look good. Well, tell, let me tell you how it worked. We'd start having war calls, which is like, uh, oh, well, at midnight, everybody in the outfit starts opening fire and screaming, gooks on the wire, gooks on the wire, in the barbed wire fences, you know. And then you'd try to kill any of the lifers that you didn't like. So we tried to get the CO a couple of times with a machine gun. One time his uh, rack took nine holes, his cot nine bullet holes, but he dove out of it and got away. Everybody would be shooting, so he couldn't check the weapon see who was shooting him. So they'd be throwing grenades at the wire and yelling and shouting, gooks on the wire, gooks, and they'd blow the siren and then run around and half the guys would be facing out where it's shooting, and then the other half would be waiting for a lifer to come out of his tent. Yeah, I've seen um, old officers executed five or six times. Just put a price on his head. Next one that kills him gets the money. Next time he was out on a mission, everybody knew it was going to happen. They just wait till he was in the right position. And the estimates run quite high. And there was the official army count is about 650 fragging incidents, and there are real reasons to doubt that because it's it must say, have been quite small. I'm sure there were a lot of them that weren't reported. Oh, of course, because no no commander wants to have. What do you say? It's like uh, some of my, my own men threw a grenade at me or tried to shoot me. I mean, how is that going to look good on your record? Are you going to get promoted up uh, up as a great leader when you're reporting that your own people are shooting at you? No, uh, I'm sure the records are uh, the figures must be substantially higher. The soldiers even put pools of money out for yes. contracts for particularly unpopular officers. But there was also suicide and self-mutilation that went on, too. People were, got desperate. If they, were, it's the, they were disoriented. They were not being cared for by their own command. Uh, the actual operations often involved slaughter of uh, innocents. Suicide rates are fairly high. Standing up in the middle of firefight. There's one famous uh, cartoon book by uh, a man named Tad Forrester, and it shows a picture of a man, of a soldier hiding behind a rock with his trigger finger in the air, looking for the million-dollar wound. The theory being, like, if he exposed this and got his index finger shot off, that he could get out of the war zone. Or you don't take your malaria pill. Uh, you know, you get therefore removed because you're incapacitated with malaria. There were many, many ways of or people shooting themselves in the foot. There are lots and lots of stories of self-mutilation. Or you do it to your friend. In other words, if your friend has, say, been wounded twice and you're on a particularly dangerous mission and he's had a premonition of death, which was taken very, very seriously, all combat soldiers are deeply superstitious, then sometimes you shoot or you, you, you stab your friend, not, not in a vital place, but to wound them enough to get them out. You You can't fight a war this way. You cannot fight a war where people are. Are you going search and avoid? Also, yeah, search and avoid. That's a very. That was a very uh, prevalent thing too. Instead of search and destroy, search and avoid. That is, you you go out and you you play you play war. You try to like you go out and you uh, smoke some dope or and you fake some radio reports or you generally try not to engage the enemy. Yes. We talked about it every day. All the guys felt the same way. We just weren't accomplishing anything. In fact, some guys were so depressed and disgusted they was killing themselves. Some guys were taking hand grenades and, and blowing themselves away. They couldn't take the strain anymore. God, it was really heavy. I don't think a lot of this stuff was reported. GIs would just kill themselves. 
in the army you'd probably send the stats home that the guy was killed or missing in action and did the anti-war movement at home have any effect on these soldiers in creating a sense of what they, what they were doing was wrong, that they were victims, they were making mistakes? Did that have impact, do you think, on the soldiers? There was a wide co coffee house, GI coffee house movement. The anti-war movement tried to set up coffee houses near U.S. bases mm -hmm. to uh, promote literature and things. But honestly, when you read soldiers' memoirs and novels, they honestly don't talk about the anti-war movement very much. It's not to say there wasn't an influence, but mm -hmm. they talk about reacting to the situation of warfare that they're in. The one that, uh, uh, and, and the, what, the moral qualms are the moral qualms that are seen on the battlefield. The one clear influence of the anti-war movement is nobody wanted to be the last die, man to die in Vietnam. I mean, once it was stated that the U.S. was going to withdraw eventually, that made it more difficult. There was one place in your book where you said that this actually was a class war, class warfare that was going on, and that black, on so black soldiers were at the forefront of the fragging and the revolt. Let's remember who went to Vietnam. After World War II, the U.S. military decided that too many college-educated men had been killed, and that the danger of this was that it was going to hurt the scientific base of the country. If the scientific base was, of the country was hurt, we couldn't have the next generation of weapons. So the idea of the 2S deferment, of the college deferment, was to keep the pool alive. What this meant was, remember, this is an era of very few student loans, very few scholarships, so on and so forth. It meant that the sons of the middle class could go to college where the sons of the working class went to the military. In the military itself, military needs vast numbers of white collar skills. So if you had any kind of like uh, clerical skills like middle class people do often do, typing, filing, so on, you could easily more readily get uh, an, a non-combat job. What this translated into is that once you started, got down to the point of who was in your infantry units, your armor and artillery, they were overwhelmed, they were disproportionately minorities and rural whites, poor rural whites, poor urban whites. So we had a, a working class, uh, largely working class military, combat military, whereas a more middle class anti-war movement and a more middle class logistic apparatus in, in the military. So it was a class revolt. A class revolt. No, I wouldn't call it a revolution. We're not talking about these people who are not socialists <laughs> now. But it is sort of like uh, this revolt against the manager, yes. It's not in our interest. They're exploiting and using us. Yes. And yeah, and certainly with among black soldiers, they, they, they were definitely influenced by the black power movement. Racial consciousness mm -hmm. and critical consciousness was very paramount. And there were many of the tie signs, of bonding signs of, you know, the skin and special handshakes, so on and so forth. How would you evaluate the mass media handling of Vietnam then and now? I spent a long time looking at the tapes, and I had, was close. It's like I'd finished my outline. I was going to write a book about television news coverage of the war, and I decided to think, well, what was not on the news frame? What I saw, and that's consequently I wrote this other book, The Perfect War. What's on the news is a lot of pictures of helicopters, a lot of pictures of jets, a lot of pictures of tanks, a lot of hardware. And in which techno war was the major representation, too, visual representation. And along with these, 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 these presentations of these beautiful weapons, I remember my favorite was an ABC show, an ABC series, where they first went out and they see the Battleship New Jersey. Battleship New Jersey had just been recommissioned in 69, and we see here's this 16-inch guns, and there's this giant 30-foot phallus that the camera looks down, and the guy starts talking about it, shoots a 250-pound projectile 16 miles, it'll go through 32 feet of reinforced concrete, or maybe I have that the other way, maybe it's 32 miles, 16 feet of reinforced concrete, I, I forget, and it's a 250-yard kill radius, and it, it's simply like the man is, the, the correspondent become a salesperson. And like, I thought, gosh, I too want the battleship New Jersey, you know, this is just cool beyond belief. And then the film cuts, and there's another correspondent, and he's on the, the, the bank of a river, and it's about the VC fling, uh, flying trash can. And do you remember the uh, Roadrunner rockets, you know, about Wiley Coyote was always getting something from Acme Rocket Company that always kind of looked like a trash can on a stick with a kind of like triangle on top of it? That's exactly what this rocket looked like. It was obviously of a homemade crude rocket. And the contrast is so great, and it seems like American victory is so ensured because we're of our technical superiority. Of course, what they don't point out, 
the Viet Cong who fires that rocket knows exactly what he's shooting at, was the battleship New Jersey very rarely knew <laughs> where its bullets were flying. So the That's what the people saw. People saw that. People do not, not see very many dead people. There were very few. The, the, the death convention on the news was much like a war movie or westerns. No, no real gore. And they saw a body count each week which showed that we were always winning. We saw one village. One village was burned in 1965. That's it. And the guy, and the guy of correspondent got in severe trouble. Um, May Lai appeared as, as, as we remember, did not come from, the news of it didn't come from the normal networks. It came from a veteran who tried hard to get the news out. Very little coverage of mass hysterics came on. The ordinary language of the war, gook, slope, slant, dink. No American news correspondent ever talked about those terms and what they meant. Never. It simply did not occur. Instead, it was very much an official perspective. Where it one got critical from 68 on, occasionally you would see reports about failed technology. And occasionally you would see stories about tragic American deaths. But it was sort of like a human interest tragedy becomes the limit of criticism rather than any kind of explanatory notion of why we aren't succeeding. Bill, let's talk about an evaluation of the Vietnam War. A lot of people have written books about it, historians and generals, and et cetera. Well, let's, let's end it just to come back to where we started to this other point. My analysis says the U.S. had to get out because we couldn't fight because we had an army that wouldn't do it anymore. Now, you could, do, you could move to Air Force campaigns, but Air Force campaigns have their problems, too. You can't hold ground with airplanes. Sending money to the South Vietnamese, they were corrupt. They just had more money to be corrupt with. So we were defeated. My analysis says the United States was defeated, and that that's, that's the standpoint. So the question is, how have the historians and the novelists and uh, so on treated the subject of American defeat? The conventional path is a liberal interpretation. That is, it's just a tragedy. It's just things <laughs> were wrong out there somewhere, and like it's just like there were all sorts of small mistakes of honorable men making small, small decisions. Arthur Schlesinger being Arthur a Arthur Schlesinger example. would be the most famous, the classical case, Stanley Carnell's most book and uh, PBS series, the most recent example. But the notion of tragedy is not an explanation. You know, 20 years of small mistakes doesn't explain a war that has a very clear structure, mm -hmm. which is my argument, and mm -hmm. the structural contradictions of that mode of warfare ended in its dissolution and failure. The second school, the most the prominent right now, is that the U.S. lost because of self-imposed restraints. Self-imposed restraints is a military term yeah. often used in Joint Chiefs of Staff documents calling for escalated air war. And their vision is that the United States should have invaded North Vietnam in 1966 and taken Hanoi and Haiphong. Of course, the only problem with that, every one of those peasants who had those guns fighting against, shooting against the aircraft, the jet fighter pilots, they were also organized and prepared for invasion. And Doug, you mentioned why, you know, you mentioned the fact that the North Vietnamese didn't have very many troops in the South. That was one of the major reasons. It wasn't that they didn't want to help their comrades and their southern comrades. It was troops were being held back to in part to protect the home front against a possible American invasion. According to GIAP, the plan for you to fight a U.S. invasion was to let local militia and regional forces fight for the first day to two days. So once the Americans were tired, after 24 to 48 hours of constant combat, then the North Vietnamese Army would enter the scene. And with this notion that the U.S. could have had a successful invasion is just the, the most bizarre unreal fantasy, unworthy of any kind of serious consideration. And even if they had put an expeditionary force in Hanoi and Haiphong, we still, that wouldn't change the class structure in South Vietnam. That wouldn't change the fact that you had a peasantry that wanted land, that you wanted Buddhists who wanted uh, self-determination rather than Catholic rule, and that you wanted, that a whole country wanted national reunification because the whole basis of the culture was throwing out the foreign invader, and that's all they'd done all their lives for 2,000 years was throw out the Chinese, the French, and now the Americans. It's that was it. Right. It wouldn't have changed it. The self-imposed restraint stool is false. Well, have we learned anything since then? We, you point out the total c corruption and self-delusion of the military and the civilian leaders throughout this, first of all, thinking they could wage a techno war, and secondly, having not paying attention to the realities which might try to seep up from the intelligence uh, field suppressing any intelligence that would uh, contrary. would contrary to what they wanted. Are, are we still in that same mode of yes. thinking? Yes. And do we, are we thinking of applying it to... <clears throat> well, we already have America. a couple of places. Certainly Grenada was one example. We took Grenada 
and we just barely took it, even though there was a minimum opposition. Most of the U.S. Special Forces commandos bit the dust in various operations because of the various mishaps of one kind or another. Also, the military's analysis is, well, not only did we fight with one high and tied behind our back, but we fought too slow. We needed a more rapid escalation. So Honduras has been prepared. A series of airfields and ports have been prepared in Honduras in order to bring 40, 50,000 troops into battle within a week. Uh, they have the facilities for this. And they still have, many of the military have the delusion that they could probably take Managua and a few other places in a couple of weeks, rather than an extensive Central American war, which would escalate tremendously, because the Nicaraguans have, their, have no choice except to expand the war outside of Nicaragua to make the battlefield bigger. If the battlefield's bigger, then the United States has to disperse its troops. If its dispersed troops are dispersed, can't achieve victory. Back to Vietnam. Back to Vietnam. Well, Sounds I, like they haven't learned a thing. They have not learned a thing. But then oh, most haven't learned a thing. There are veterans, of course, in the U.S. who now who certainly don't want to see this. There are probably parts of the military in very subordinate positions who don't want to see a major escalation. But generally, we're on track for another kind of, of major intervention, whether or not it will be since the Iran-Agua crisis has emerged. Uh, that may be off for a while. I don't know. But there's certainly Philippines. There's another growing insurgency there. Um, the, chan the chances for another major intervention and another series of self-delusions are, are very, very high. Because the people, the officer corps who were successful in Vietnam are the people who are in charge now. The people who were the dissidents, the, the few handfuls of lieutenant colonels and majors who were, who just got repulsed, they got out. They resigned. Most of them did. Ironically, the Army itself recognized this in 1970 in a war college study, which indicated that there is a significant difference between the ideal Army values such as honesty, integrity, bravery, justice, and responsibility, and the real values which are practiced by the military in order to promote career advancement. Here is the study's conclusion. The present climate does not appear to be self-correcting, the human drives for success and recognition by seniors, sustained if not inflamed by the system of rewards and management which cater to immediate personal success at the expense of moral and ethical values, would appear to only be perpetuated by the current environment. The fact alone that the leaders of the future are those who survived and excelled within the rules of the present system militates in part against any self-starting incremental return toward the practical application of ideal Army values. And then the final reason I note the problem of learning is that there are cultural reasons that make the American people want to believe the self-imposed restraint school. And that is we are used to the tradition of the cowboy who comes in and saves a society against the enemies when the power structure cannot defend itself. The idea of a weak authority that has to be saved by a warrior shows up in many places in American culture. In the Western, in the detective hero, the detective hero is outside the law. All the Superman and the Mask Avenger figures of the 20s and 30s certainly are able to foil criminals that legal authorities cannot. Um, but also, isn't there a deep belief that technology cannot fail certainly in American to, culture? That if we have enough technological or military force, we can't help but win a war. It's, it's people, it's hard not to believe in your hardware. Americans don't learn about social relations. They don't learn about class structure every day in the newspaper or about cultural history every day in the newspaper. They learn about what's for sale. Then what right. is the lesson of Vietnam concerning the limits of techno-war, the situations in which Techno-war can destroy, but it cannot achieve victory. Mm. It can destroy land, it can destroy people, but it can't create a government, it can't create a culture, it can't create a society. I mean, this was another thing we tried to do in Vietnam, to impose the model of the consumer society on them and American-style supposed democracy where there'd be elections in situations where these just couldn't work. Oh, well, it did work in a way. In other words, yeah, people can become corrupted. They did get into their drugs and their Hondas and things, but it just doesn't build a stable society. It doesn't build... Uh, it doesn't build people who are willing to die for that society. That was the whole problem they had. You had plenty of corrupted Vietnamese, but when it looks like things were near, they weren't willing to go out and defend Saigon to the death or not 
They just did. They bought their tickets out to the United States. Whereas the peasants were willing to fight to death just for land. Yes. And just for getting rid of their landlords or local oppressors. Yes. It made perfect sense to them. And there's been this problem, the so-called Vietnam Syndrome, which our leaders have been complaining <coughs> about all these years, as if there was a sickness in the land. That the a Americans, loss of will to fight, yes. And, but it looks like the American public had a clearer picture of what uh, the war was all about than the, than the leaders. But uh, what do you, how would you assess that, and do you think that they were overcoming that Vietnam Syndrome now so that they can... Well, I don't think the American public ever had an idea what was wrong. They just knew something was wrong and that it wasn't getting better. In fact, I think I need their fuzziness made it easier for people to believe the self-imposed restraint school, mm -hmm. to believe that we lost because we didn't fight hard enough. Um, for, the past, for the past few years, popular culture has presented the hero, that the warrior imagery is well, very much mm -hmm. strong on the rise. We've had many classical war movies made and several kind of variant war movies made. Um, it's definitely a war culture. How people, though, Clearly, though, there's, there's still a resistance. There's still a certain level in which the disaster of Vietnam is etched in at least some people's memories. And even though it's, they don't have an understanding of why it failed or what were the structural reasons, there is a fear that it will happen again. In Bill Gibson's book, The Perfect War, he quotes Tim O'Brien's novel, Going After Cacciato about the difficulty of determining reality for Americans in Vietnam. Here's what he said. They did not know even the simple things, a sense of victory or satisfaction or necessary sacrifice. They didn't know the feeling of taking a place and keeping it or securing a village and then raising the flag and calling it a victory. No sense of order or momentum, no front, no rear, no trenches laid out in neat parallels, no Patton rushing for the Rhine, no beachheads to storm and win and hold for the duration. They didn't have targets. They didn't have a cause. They didn't know if if it was a war of ideology, or economics, or hegemony, or spite. On a given day, they didn't even know where they were. They didn't know the terms of war, its architecture, the rules of fair play. When they took prisoners, which was rare, they didn't know how to question or to ask, or whether to release a suspect or to beat on him. They didn't know how to feel, whether seeing a dead Vietnamese to be happy or sad or relieved, and whether in times of quiet to be apprehensive or content, whether to engage the enemy or elude him. They didn't know how to feel when they saw villages burning Revenge, loss, peace of mind, or anguish. They didn't know. All these uncertainties never articulated in war stories. Emotion squandered on ignorance. They did not know good from evil. <laughs> 